I'm not talking about bananas and apples and all. They may be thinking that because, as you told, you know, they are a bit carnal-minded, you see. <laughs> I mean, uh, what results did you really get out of it? By this, I mean, how many Christians came to you and said, Amma did that, Mr. Amma did that. Now I want to put down Christianity and I want to take up Islam because I've seen the truth in it. You know, things like that. Yes. We have converted, since we started the works, more than 6,500 people. Hindus, You haven't answered my question. Hindus, Christians, and Jews. More than 6,500 my little office has done so far. Now, I want each and every Muslim to get involved. Every Muslim should be doing the job. It's not one man's job. It's not one society's job. It's every Muslim's job. As every Christian is trying to do the work for his belief, the Muslim must do the same. And if one out of all this, if one fellow is benefited, my exercise is worth it. If I have saved one Muslim from falling into the mess, being tantalized for a Christian wife or some money or going to take revenge on his parents, he wants to become a Christian if he sees this, and it works. You see, there is a Jamal Khan, he's a Molvi in Marion Hill. Molvi, you know Molvi? Like our priest, Muslim priest. We have no priesthood, but take it. He's an Imam, Jamal Khan by name. He came to Verulam many years ago. When, when, when I arranged a lecture for him. He was in my house at dinner. And while at the table, he tells me, he says, you know, Mr. Didat, you saved my life. So I'm scanning in my head. I said, I know, so-and-so, something, my fellow was drowning, I pulled him out, and somebody else was there, I says, I helped him too. But when did I save your life? So he says, you know, around 1951-52, he said, your brother-in-law was in the Springfield Dormerton Hospital, TB Hospital, and you used to come there every week. I said, yes. He said, you see, at that time I was also a patient in the TB Hospital. So I said, so? He said, you see, there were Christian missionaries harassing your brother-in-law, and you came one day with the Bible, and you were showing them contradictions in the Bible, and he says, I was watching over your shoulder. I don't know. He says, I was watching over your shoulder. And what you showed them to the Christian missionaries, I saw and I tore up my certificates. I was training for the priesthood. Muslim. I was training for the priesthood. I was about to be ordained. And what I saw, I says, no, man, I'm wasting my time. I'm barking up the wrong tree. So I tore up the certificates. He's a Molvi now, a priest in Marion Hill. Look, I didn't know. If he didn't tell me, I wouldn't know. And there could be dozens here. If they can, the, the faith can be saved by listening to this, I said, look, man, where are you going to fall into this? Where? Said, what this book has done to Gorman and Baker and Swaggart, it will do to you. What is doing to the Americans? 13% of the American people, they are committing incest with their own daughters. I said, you will do the same. 8% of the white Christians in South Africa are committing incest with their daughters. I said, you will do the same. So... I'm trying to warn my brethren, keep away from this book. Bernard Shaw said, the most dangerous book on earth. But I want them to study it in conjunction with my book. Get this book and then use that as a textbook. This is a book of instructions and use this, it will be valuable. If not, you're also going to go the same way as Swagart. In uh, uh, conclusion. I'm afraid we have two questions. I think we must uh, give up the last one. The last one. I hope so. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Didat. I must congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, for the calm way in which you've conducted the meeting this evening. Uh, I'm not going to accord the same grace to Mr. Didat. And that is the question I want to ask him. Obviously, I'm not of his faith, and he knows me. Um, Mr. Didat, what I would like to ask you is you pointed out to us that in the Quran, it says that Allah is loving. What does Allah require of his servants? What does Allah require of his servants? If he is a loving being, what does he require of his servants? What he requires from us, from all, is to believe in him and follow his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. 
listen to God, believe in God, and keep his commandments. This is what he requires of you. You do that, he loves you, and he will reward you. You disobey, you pay the price. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does in a way. I'll continue if I can, seeing as I'm the last one, perhaps you give me the license. Um, in, the, in the Quran as well, um, it says that Jesus Christ is a prophet. So you admit to the existence of Jesus Christ. What is your question? All right. You admit to the... To the what is your question? Because now, my question what is, you are carrying on now, like in a court of law, you are not interrogating me no, no. as a public prosecutor. No. What is your question? I hope I'm not that. Your question. No. Your question. I, Come to right. the conclusion of what you have in mind. My question is that Jesus Christ in John chapter 15 tells us that he gives all people a commandment, especially those who follow him, that they love one another as he has loved them. Why? Because he laid down his life for them while they were yet sinners. Now, that is the same love, I believe, that you are telling me that Allah is talking about. Therefore, if you are going to show love towards us, and I mean, you said there was 1.8 billion Christians who don't agree with you. If you were going to show that same love towards us, who are not of the same persuasion of you, why are you antagonistic? Why don't you show that characteristic of love towards these people, hoping to convince them of their error? Jesus Christ is described to be the most loving person on earth. He is supposed to be the Lamb of God, meek and humble. Well, listen to him, you generation of wipers, you brood of snakes, you hypocrites, you wicked and adulterous generation, you fools, you white sepulchers, you tell me. Who was he talking about? He's talking about his people. That's right. The, the scribes, elders of his people. The scribes and right. the Pharisees. So in other words, now, if this was speaking for Jesus Christ, I never used any such language at all. Whatever I said tonight was more insipid than what Jesus had said. And despite the stupendous contrast between the language used by Jesus and me, you still say Jesus is the meek, humble Lamb of God. You still say that. He said, on his march on Jerusalem, if you remember, he said, for those my enemies who would not, that, we should, that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me, cut their throats. Did he say that? Did he go with people in the temple? Did I do any such thing? Look, I'm only speaking, I'm trying to reason. And it's a natural thing that if the thing goes against the grain, it makes a noise. The tongue. It's going against the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. I'm allowed one more, just comment on what he said. Right. You know, the, the one thing I would like to say is, when Jesus Christ castigated the scribes and the Pharisees, the result was that they became totally estranged from him. I'm saying your attitude tonight has perhaps done the same. Thank you. You have obviously done extensive research. Clearly, you're a man of education. So, I thank you on behalf of all present for sharing your interpretation, your knowledge, and experience with us. All those who ask questions, thank you for asking those questions. They were indeed interesting. And lastly, to the audience, thank you for attending. Please give it to us.